So remember that last week, Jesus was castigating the Pharisees for the way they placed human traditions above God's commandments. There is nothing, he said, that outside a person that by going in can defile. It is the things that come out are what defile. In the house, Jesus explains this more fully to his disciples, and after that, they leave so Jesus can take a little break. From the story, we can tell that he's trying to get away. By away, in this case, he means away from Jewish territory, away from work. He wants a vacation. So he heads north to the city of Tyre, and that's where he stops, just outside of Galilee. And that's where this woman finds him. She's Syrophoenician, which in this story is a long word that simply means not Jewish. She comes asking for help, but Jesus isn't interested. He's helped Gentile people before now, but right now he's off the clock. Maybe it's dealing with the constant infuriating hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the legalism of the scribes. Maybe it's the stress of constantly having to explain things to his overly dense disciples. Maybe it's just the frustration of being interrupted while he's trying to take a break. But in this story, Jesus gets curt. He gets more than curt. He gets abusive. When this woman comes asking for help, Jesus responds by calling her a dog. Now, we still have a word in English that means a female dog that we use to insult and belittle people, especially women, but also sometimes men. Additionally, in the context of this story, it helps to remember that dogs are unclean. If you've ever had a dog, you know that they defile themselves by rolling in unimaginable things. They eat things that are dead and rotting, whether or not those things are kosher. When Jesus calls this woman a dog, he is specifically calling her unclean, and therefore unworthy to stand before him and ask what she's asking. But wait a minute. Didn't Jesus just say that external things can't make a person unclean? Isn't what happens in this story completely contrary to what he just taught? Doesn't Jesus sound in this story a little bit like a hypocrite? Yes, that's right. I just called Jesus a hypocrite. <laughs> Remember what he said to the Pharisees last week. Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They do, in vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Well, that insult that Jesus just hurled at this mother pleading for her daughter is based on a human precept about what makes a person clean or unclean. So yeah, I think Jesus in this story is a hypocrite. And astonishingly, the woman takes Jesus' insult and verbally redirects it to her own advantage, some sort of uh, rhetorical jujitsu here. Now, there's one person in the Gospels who does this frequently. In fact, they're quite famous for it. That person's name is Jesus. So in this story, Jesus is in the position of the Pharisees, embodying a prejudice born out of human tradition, and this unnamed Gentile woman, who is unclean by Jewish standards, is in the position of Jesus. She's proclaiming God's expansive love. Now it's she who teaches him something about who God is and how God works. In this story, it is the woman, not Jesus, who is the rabbi. And you know what? Jesus listens. He admits that he's wrong. He accepts her correction. In this story, Jesus repents. If you don't believe me, then take a look at what happens next. Mark says that Jesus returns, implying that he's going back to where he came from. Where he came from is Gennesaret in Galilee, just a few miles south. But according to Mark, he returns by way of Sidon. If you pull out a Bible and look at a map, you see that Sidon is north of Tyre. He returns by Sidon, 
uh, by way of Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, which is uh, south and east. And he goes to the region of the Decapolis, which is across the sea from Gennesaret, across the sea on the Gentile side. Instead of going back to the Jews, Jesus is hanging out for a while in Gentile territory. Now, as I read this story, I see Jesus actively learning from this encounter with this Gentile woman, choosing to continue working among the Gentiles. In the next story, he is again approached by people asking for help on another's behalf, just like in Tyre. But this time, instead of throwing insults, he helps them. And not just that, instead of healing from a distance like he did with the woman's daughter, in this story, Jesus gets up close and personal. He puts fingers in the man's ears. He touches his tongue. There's spit involved. Jesus defiles himself by touching this Gentile and touching him in very intimate places. And that special word that Jesus uses to heal the man, Mark tells us that word means be opened, which, if you think about it, is kind of what happens to Jesus in Tyre. He's opened to a more expansive view of his own ministry, an expansive view of to whom God is calling him to show love. So here's my question to you all. Does this version of the story, the version where Jesus is a hypocrite who needs to repent, does that version make you uncomfortable? Are you squirming in your seats a little bit right now? If so, I want you to ask yourself, why? Why does that make you so uncomfortable? Why is it hard to think about Jesus Christ, God's Son, repenting? And growing. I wonder if maybe it has to do with what we are taught about Jesus and about God. Jesus is God's Son, right? One of the three persons of the Trinity and therefore co equal and co eternal with the Father and the Spirit. And God is, well, God, right? God is perfect, God is unflawed. As James wrote last week, God, in God there is no variation or shadow due to change. That the Son of God might be wrong, might need to admit being wrong, and to repent seems antithetical to what it means to us to be God in the first place. But what if it's not? Those Pharisees we talked about, they're the ones who are known for not ever changing or growing. Whenever Jesus confronts the Pharisees the way he was confronted in this story, they grumble and they sulk and they just get angrier and angrier until that anger turns into a tight little ball and they start plotting to kill Jesus. They're almost comically incapable of growth in these stories. They're so unwilling to change their minds or their hearts or their beliefs that they would literally kill to avoid it. God, on the other hand, according to the stories, knows when to change their mind. God haggles with Abraham over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham wins. God decides not to destroy Israel in the wilderness when Moses reminds them about the promise they made to the people. God relents from punishing Nineveh when the people heed Jonah's message. Whenever God does change their mind, it is always for mercy. And that's how Jesus' mind changes in this story. I wonder if the Pharisees are so intractable because that's how they know God to be. If there's no room for them to change or grow or move because to do so would by necessity mean moving away from God. It would mean letting God down, subjecting themselves to God's disappointment and, fun and punishment for failing to meet those unambiguous standards that they have learned since they were small. 
their God is waiting at the finish line for them. And they know that anyone else who doesn't, that they and anyone else who doesn't finish the race will have to answer for every inch that they fall short. Perhaps Jesus is able to grow because that is how he knows God to be. He knows a God who grows, who can change and adapt and evolve. In that growth, there is freedom. Not only freedom to fail, but also freedom to succeed. Because he is able to let go of what he knows to be right in order to be opened to what is true, he's able to meet God in this story in a new way. Now, if that's true, then perhaps we need to rethink what we know about righteousness. If our call is to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, maybe that so-called perfection is less about being without flaw, more about being able to keep growing. Maybe being godly is less a destination than it is a journey. Perhaps it's in that journey that we find God rather than in some state of being good. Maybe it's in these moments when we think that we have arrived, that we have attained some sort of goodness or moral uprightness or principled position, that we are actually furthest from God because we've lost the incentive to keep growing, to keep moving, to keep going forward. When I know I am right, when I know that God is on my side on the, and on the side of my principles and my convictions and that I have nowhere else to go and nothing else to learn, I wonder if that is when I can be the most pharisaic, the most susceptible to seeing other people as dogs and ignoring what they have to teach me. This is a healing story. But healing stories are never about physical healing. And so I wonder if this story is less about the healing of the woman's daughter and the man who can't speak or hear, and more about the healing of Jesus. At his baptism, the rending of the heavens and the conspicuous dove and the heavenly voice made it abundantly clear to Jesus that he is the beloved Son of God in whom they are well pleased. That would be enough to give me a big head. When this woman confronts Jesus' belief in his own superiority, God's beloved son suddenly recognizes God's beloved daughter in a face that he never expected. I wonder if this isn't the place where we can see God in this story. Not in the rude and embrace of Jesus, but in the way Jesus has his experience of God expanded and his prejudice healed. Personally, I am reassured by the fact that even Jesus needs healing sometimes because that means that I can see him in myself, not only when I am fighting for justice or standing up for what I believe to be right, but also when I am accepting correction when I learn to see the face of God in another, even an opponent. I'm grateful that in these moments of my greatest weakness, God is not far away because Jesus himself has been right where I am. A God who repents, who not only heals but needs healing, is a God in whom there is room even for me. It means that when I am confronted by my own pride, my own arrogance, my own blindness, I don't have to be ashamed of falling short. Because in this God, I have the freedom to let go of what holds me back, to become who God is calling me to be. When I make mistakes, when I can't be perfect, I remember that God is not in the perfection, but in the help that I receive to grow. As we've all been taught, true strength is not about never making mistakes, it's about being able to grow from them. And I wonder if that's where God is in this story, 
in the growth. A God who repents teaches me how to repent. A God who needs healing teaches me how to be healed. Now, this is just one way of looking at the story. It's not the only way. It's not even necessarily the right way. But to read the story like this gives me hope for overcoming my own partiality, my own prejudice, my own weakness. Because the God who calls me forward calls me through such things, not in spite of them. In this story, I meet a God who redeems things like this, even turns my liabilities into God's assets. I meet a God who is capable of making even a cross into something beautiful.